So hello to everyone who is joining us now for the Inclusive Economy Pathways Towards Decent Work and Economic Resilience panel. Um, on this, at least in Kitchener-Waterloo, uh, lovely Thursday afternoon. Um, we're enjoying this nice stretch of warm, sunny weather. I hope that it looks like that wherever you are in the audience. Um, I'm really delighted today to be able uh, to host for the next 45 minutes, uh, a panel where we're going to be talking about um, pro making progress towards sustainable development goal number eight, uh, promoting sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment and decent work, uh, with an eye to what that looks like um, during and in the aftermath of the COVID-19 global pandemic. So I am Sean Gobi. I'm an assistant professor in social innovation at the University of Waterloo's School of Environment, Enterprise and Development. Um, and uh, I want to highlight amongst the things that I work on, I'm the principal investigator uh, behind something called the Legacy Leadership Lab, which is a national initiative aimed at enabling small businesses to convert into community-based social enterprises, um, nonprofits and cooperatives. Uh, in response to crises like uh, COVID-19 or owners retiring. Um, this is a, a, a project that's funded by uh, the Social Finance Fund from the federal government of Canada. Now, with me on the panel is Raphael Schapp, uh, a, who's a former Wall Street tax attorney and um, is a founding partner advisor to the Pre-Distribution Initiative. Uh, Shannon Rohan uh, is the Chief Strategy Officer for SHARE, uh, the Shareholder Association for Research and Education, uh, which advises investors, um, and helps institutional investors advance environmental, social, and governance goals. Uh, amongst the projects she's working on is the Valuing Decent Work Initiative there. And Taylor C. Ken, from, who's a director at Social Capital Partners, uh, which is a, a quite innovative think do tank that develops social financing solutions uh, to be taken up by the private sector. Um, and much of their current work is actually focused on encouraging employee ownership to help tackle um, growing income and wealth inequality uh, in the world. So, um, where are we right now? Well, one of the things we've seen is that you know, COVID-19 hasn't just revealed a health crisis. It's revealed a lot of the underlying economic structures that we've been dealing with uh, globally and within our own countries, um, many of them for generations. Uh, we're seeing major cash flow challenges for small businesses and the fragility of that sector. Um, we're also seeing the fragility of global supply chains um, and how quickly they can break down in times of crisis and how we have turned to uh, often quite monopolistic tech platforms like Amazon to be providing us with a lot of the essentials and basics we need in our households. Tied to this is that uh, a lot of what has really always been present has been revealed to us about work, the importance of work and, and the structure of it, um, the deeply gendered nature of work. Um, I and many others who are still working, working from home, um, who have small children are seeing that uh, the importance of childcare uh, and other social services that are uh, usually delivered by women workers uh, play in our lives. Um, we're also seeing clearly who does get to work under conditions of lockdown and who doesn't, um, further entrenching a lot of the wealth and income inequalities we're seeing in our societies. And of course, um, the phrase essential worker has been on the tip of everyone's tongues and it's um, quite uh, revealing for many people to see that the workers who in times of crisis are most essential are often ones who are most marginally employed and underpaid uh, often in very unsafe working conditions. So this is this time has been like a revelation to many. Um, and the people we have on our panel with us are ones who've actually been working on a lot of the underlying issues that have been brought to the surface for many years. Um, and so I'm going to start our conversation uh, by directing a question towards uh, Raphael. So 
I, like many of the folks uh, who are listening in on this conversation, um, have been turning to online platforms like Instacart, Uber Eats, or Amazon to deliver food and other essential uh, items to my household. Um, and in this time of social distancing, I'm wondering from your perspective what you're seeing in terms of both the, the importance of these platforms and the dominance of them in our economy, as well as the often precarious employment that is attached to that type, the workforces that they rely on. Right, so hello everyone. What you're describing here is the, the rise of what has been dubbed platform capitalism. Uh, which is really the triumph of a business model that monopolizes an entire market segment uh, through network effects by connecting different users. Um, and there, as a consequence of the, so the economics of the attention economy uh, with a high concentration of online audience, you end up with these large behemoths, um, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Uber, Airbnb, etc. There's two issues two issues there. First, the owners of these platforms, of the algorithm, enjoy these very almost perpetual returns um, and they're uniquely positioned to extract the data and monetize it. Um, it's a very extractive model which diminishes the profit share that goes to labor and it also disciplines workers in new ways. So, you know, with euphemisms such as the sharing economy, the gig economy, the on-demand economy kind of imply that these firms are providing more freedom and more flexibility around work somehow, but um, they also entrench existing inequality and biases um, and they allow the platforms to exert closer monitoring over users and over employee performance. And this is part of a broader trend um, of employers demanding more flexible labor. Um, workers are in increasingly transitioning to these alternative work arrangements which are characterized by um, unpredictability of working hours and little to no employee benefits. Uh, and an increasing share of new jobs are characterized by no security in this way, low wages, contingent work, et cetera. A recent paper by Katz and Kruger, two economists, found that the percentage of workers increased from 10% in 2005 to almost 16% in 2015. This was already five years ago. It's not just the gig economy, but it's also this broader category of temp, fragile workers, contract company workers, independent contractors, and so forth. Uh, and so it's part of a, a trend of more economic risk being shouldered by average workers. It's something that Jacob Hacker uh, has described as the great risk shift, um, where um, there's been increasingly uh, um, an outsourcing of risks onto the shoulders of average workers, things like technological change, skill obsolescence, business fluctuations, et cetera. And so it contributes to this greater economic insecurity and you can measure that. You can look at things like the volatility in earnings, the probability of experiencing a sudden loss in income and just downward mobility um, in general. Uh, it's part of a process of the weakening of labor that's been going on in the past decades. There are a number of macroeconomic trends that exemplify this. Uh, I'm not going to share a PowerPoint with a gazillion charts, but I want to just highlight a few of those trends. One is uh, the fall in the labor share. Labor share is the fraction of total GDP that goes to workers. That was pretty, uh, pretty stable at around 62% for most of the 20th century, and then in the 70s, it just starts to go down. Uh, another trend is the stagnation of wages. Um, there's the famous wage productivity disconnect, and that also starts in the 70s. Um, had, uh, so had wages risen in line with productivity, um, the average worker would be making a lot more. Um, the Economic Policy Institute found that instead of making 40K today, you would be making more something like 61K, right? Um, so workers haven't really been able to build any wealth. Um, the Federal Reserve in the US found that 60% of households can't even come up with $400 if they have an emergency. So this was all happening pre-COVID, right? Um, there's broader trends, um, and I'll wrap up quickly, 
uh, there's rising industrial concentration. Uh, you can measure this with things like HHI index or just looking at the number of superstar firms in the economy you know, that capture greater and greater segment of their market. It's good for shareholders, but it's not so good for workers. Uh, there's evidence that it drives up, that concentration drives up pay differences between firms. It's also linked to the fall of the labor share, um, which is higher in industries that have experienced um, more market concentration. There's also another dimension of this, which is the concentration of capital and investment, looking at the role of institutional investors. Uh, and this is being exacerbated by the pandemic, by the way. Um, so one of the lasting consequences of COVID will most certainly be more economic concentration. The tech giants have emerged as clear winners. Just want to give you one stat. Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, and Facebook make up more than 21% of the S&P 500, a fifth. You know. um, another trend that's really worrying that we need to think about is the low level of investment in the economy. Uh, even in sectors that have had high valuation, we find that investment is lower than it should be, about 10% is the estimate. Uh, you find that firms are returning cash to shareholders, you know, share buybacks and so forth, rather than reinvesting. Um, and it's also linked to concentration because the top firms are crowding out investment and the firms that are left behind don't really have any incentive to invest. Um, so I think these trends were all there before COVID, now are being ex exacerbated. So that's what we need to think about. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think there's a, you know, these themes of monopolization and the concentration of, of the power of capital often at the expense of, of labor. Um, one of the terms that we've all been hearing a lot and practicing is social distancing. Um, which, you know, in practical terms really means physical distancing but also there is an element of us being socially isolated as a part of this. And uh, traditionally, the way that labor would capture a greater share of economic output was more often than not through collective bargaining. Um, and so I'm gonna turn to, um, to Shannon to ask, you know, in this time um, where we've, we've, we've gone through decades of seeing union power being undermined and collective bargaining more generally being undermined. Um, is there a path for advancing worker power? Does it involve going back to that? Is it another direction we need to go in? Uh, what are your thoughts? Thanks, Sean. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be here today. I'm joining from the wet West Coast. Uh, from the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and it's great to be a part of uh, today's conversation. Uh, I think a couple of things are interesting and important to point out from your question, and I think the first is to distinguish between social distancing and solidarity. Uh, I think it is actually in this crisis that we're seeing so many acts of so solidarity despite the sort of social distancing and physical distancing. distancing. And I think we need to actually draw inspiration from those. Um, so giving up our civic freedoms to stay home and keep others safe is actually a significant act of solidarity. Um, but there are also the small acts where citizens are coming together at seven, they're going out on their balconies, they're banging pots to say thank you and show our support and solidarity for healthcare workers. Our kids are putting hearts on their windows and writing messages of support. And I don't think these small acts are insignificant. I actually think they're quite significant. Um, and and uh, I think we're realizing that our own well-being, in fact, depends on the well-being of others and those around us. And so, uh, you know, I think, you know, we need to draw inspiration uh, from those. And of course, as part of that, there's this visibility of these workers, of cleaners, janitors, healthcare workers, grocery store workers, the people delivering our food, that in fact, they are essential. We need them to stay safe at the same time that they're risking uh, their own safety, health, health and safety, and often those of their families. So I think that's an important moment that is really critical for us to build on as we think about how we move from the current crisis into sort of a post-COVID. Um, but we're still facing all of those challenges that Raphael talked about, right? We're still 
Uh, and in fact, we're going to see a significant pushback, um, I, I think, and, and, a, and an attempt to deepen the divisions uh, and deepen the individualization of risk that Raphael talked about. We often think of this uh, in the context of a fissured workplace, for example, which is a concept that was developed by uh, David Wheel, where we're seeing this increasing level of intermediation in labor markets. And that's essentially an attempt to divide and conquer, right? Um, that's an attempt to break down any sort of collective power. So rather than having employees working together with, for company X, we're hiring them as individual contractors, we're hiring them through staffing and management agencies, um, and even to some extent hiring them as, as independent uh, business owners, which is you know, a complete misclassification. Um, and so we're still up against those things. And we're seeing, you know, for example, some tech companies currently in the COVID crisis are announcing that they're going to just keep people working from home, right? They're not gonna come back into a workplace environment. Um, so what does that mean, it, it, you know, for workers to be able to come together uh, and see each other in a collective way? Um, and these efforts, of course, have effectively concentrated the power of employers vis-a-vis -vis the workforce. And historically, workers counterbalance that uh, through collective bargaining. And so to your question, is this still a critical path to advancing worker power? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think we absolutely have to recognize this, the importance of trade unions and the importance of collective bargaining. So there, we're not at a point to replace that. Uh, you know, I see the efforts in my city of Vancouver, uh, the Unite Here recent um, uh, campaigning and, and, uh, and bargaining efforts for the rights of hotel workers and particularly the safety of women uh, who were facing, you know, uh, abuse and har harassment, sexual harassment. And, you know, much of that strike was about the protection of those workers and their health and safety. So I think that still needs to be front and center. But of course, there's other tools in the toolbox that we can and should deploy. And that's really the work uh, that SHARE has been dedicated to over the past 20 years. And that's really around capital stewardship. And I think one of the things that may be surprising to folks is how much of the capital that is circulating in capital markets is actually workers' capital, the deferred retirement savings of work workers, which is accumulated, as we know, in, in collectively funded schemes like, like pension funds. Um, and the value of these retirement savings are not insignificant, right? Uh, in OECD countries, you're looking at around $43 trillion in workers' capital. In Canada, that number is $2 trillion. You know, you compare that to uh, one of the biggest banks and the biggest banks doesn't, you know, is, is less than half of that. So this is a significant amount of money. You combine that with things like foundations, universities, religious investors and others, you have a bit of power there. And that's really the work that we do is to use that power to shift um, uh, corporate practices and, and to promote improved sustainability practices in the companies, their portfolios. And so it was interesting, you know, this idea that this um, efforts to reward financial capital, efforts to uh, increasingly reduce the labor share of capital um, is good for shareholders and not so good for workers. But we would argue it's, you know, first of all, that dichotomy is not necessarily uh, true. Workers are also shareholders. Um, and it's not good for shareholders. It's definitely not good for shareholders over the long term who depend on stability of systems and stability of uh, social political systems, ecosystems, uh, etc. And so one of the areas that we focus on, and I'll just give a couple examples here, is, is how we're promoting decent work. Uh, and we're certainly asking companies uh, uh, about things like uh, executive compensation and we you know can no longer establish executive compensation in this bubble or vacuum uh, where it's really decoupled from either the economy or the performance of the rest of the company or the compensation of the rest of the employees of that company um, and so when we see things like Walt Disney making the CEO making 911 times the medium employee wage while Disney workers are sleeping in their cars because they can't afford to pay rent like this is just not sustainable and we need uh, uh, you know and, and our work is really getting shareholders to to come out quite um, uh, strongly against those kinds of practices. And the other piece I just wanted to talk about 
briefly is around workers' voices and accountability. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about um, stakeholder capitalism, the business roundtable talking about the purpose of the corporation, uh, not only being to serve shareholders, but to create value for all. And those are really nice words. Those are really nice sentiments. Um, but unfortunately, we need to see some actual structural changes. We need to actually see accountability built in uh, to uh, the corporate governance, particularly in other levels. So, you know, the things that we're going uh, to boards and asking on behalf of uh, the shareholders that we work with is, is to actually establish explicit accountability within the company uh, or within the board, I'm sorry, uh, for oversight of workforce net management. So we want to see boards of directors and individual directors be held accountable for the practices that we're seeing on the ground across the workforce. And I think that's a continuation, right? We want to see those accountability mechanisms. But what about actually putting stakeholders on boards? What about actually having their voices in the heart of where the power is? Those are the kinds of things that we want to see. Um, and so I'll leave it there. Um, uh, and uh, that's a little sense of sort of the work that we're doing. Well, thank you, Shannon. And I think that's a great place to, to turn to Taylor and some of the work that you're doing with social capital partners. Um, you know, we're, we're in the midst of what is almost certainly, uh, I mean, already all signs are pointing this to be pointing to this being the largest economic downturn since at least the Great Depression, um, which has happened with a, with a rapidity um, that is uh, simply boggling to those of us who've looked at the statistics, uh, wages, output, uh, employment numbers. Um, a lot of the work that you've been doing and Social Capital Partners has been doing is very on the ground. Uh, what is it that you've been um, seeing that and working on that you think could provide all of us with a bit of hope that as we rebuild from this economic collapse, um, that we actually can have and build a more inclusive economy moving forward? Thanks, John. And <clears throat> thanks everyone for, for joining the presentation. It's great to be here. Um, look, I think uh, I'll, I'll get to the optimism, but what I don't want to get past is that this is a crisis that's hitting the people that were least prepared to deal with it the hardest, and, and that is a really unfortunate reality, right? So if you think about people in the service sector, people in precarious work, if you think about small businesses that were already struggling to compete against bigger players in, in an online economy, all of these were the groups that have been hit the hardest, that have been forced to bear most of the consequences. And, uh, and, that, and that, that's just the reality we have to accept and deal with in this situation, right? And I think in particular, what we've realized is we've had what you know, anyone that's in the financial market would say is the greatest bull run in history, a recovery that, you know, from the financial crisis that you know, looks great on paper, but why is it that there are so many people that have been left, left behind as a part of that growth, right? And I think if there is something to be optimistic about right now, it's that I think there is more of a public awareness to the issues that Raphael and Shannon are mentioning, that we are starting to talk about them openly. And in Canada, as an example, starting to realize that, look, inequality is an issue here too, right? And we can't spend all our time talking about how to you know, increase minimum wage and deal with the income side because people really need a chance to build wealth so that they can be resilient in downturns like this. That's true of small businesses, it's true of, of individual workers, right? And so, uh, so that's, I think that's an important part for us to, to be thinking about. Now, in terms of the public awareness and, and why that gives me some optimism, you know, we're, we saw with the, the program the government recently launched for large businesses, it's conditional on environmental changes, it's conditional on not doing stock buybacks. Like we're now getting to a point where we're realizing that the approach we took in the last recovery isn't enough. There's bigger problems we're dealing with and we've got to start to tackle that. Um, and that's more of a macro sort of point of optimism, I think, that it's only going to continue to be a good thing if we stay focused on it. Now, now that said, from the work that we do, you know, this is creating an interesting window for us to rethink, um, you know, you know, what do we do with the businesses that are struggling today after, after this crisis? You know, we're, we're focused right now on helping business owners that are looking to retire to actually transition their companies to employee ownership. We think it's a great model to help workers build wealth and to sort of address some of the power dynamics that others have mentioned on this call. Um, now, uh, that's, you know, tough. The, the, the reality is for a lot of the businesses that we're looking to do a transition, now is the worst time because, you know, value is being hit and, and all of that. And in addition, there's a lot of people sitting on the sidelines that have been waiting for a crisis to buy up these businesses. So it is a competitive environment, um, but, uh, but we're optimistic that with that increased public awareness and with you know, 
a focus from the government and from others around how do we build a more inclusive economy in a real meaningful way, that things like employee ownership might start to take off. Um, and so that's, that's where some of our, our optimism comes from and, and some of the things we're starting to see. Great, thanks, Taylor. And I think the um, you know the the piece about employee ownership and what enterprises that are employee owned uh, looks like um, ties in naturally to I think some of what Shannon was talking about in terms of representation on boards and what that governance looks like on that ground level. Um, I know one of the things that uh, we've often seen in looking at the space of, of social finance and ESG oriented investment is the question of fiduciary duty and the responsibilities that those directors have, um, directors and investors have. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, Shannon, if you could uh, just speak a bit to what, how that connects with you know, the real long-term actual intergenerational obligations that, um, that we really have um, to, to the future. Great, thanks, Sean. Yeah, I do think um, fiduciary duty is, is a critical issue and one that certainly um, we've been working on for quite some time. Um, and, and particularly, we focus on uh, the trustees and uh, the role of the governing boards who have fiduciary responsibilities to the beneficiaries uh, of the pension plan. Um, and that duty is really to provide a retirement income for uh, employees upon retirement. Um, I think the important issue to raise here is that those pension term liabilities are long term. Uh, they're not only for folks who are 40, 50, 60 or, or in retirement. In, they're you know, for beneficiaries who are entering the workforce, starting to pay retirement, who may not retire for 30 years. And when they retire, they could very likely be retiring for another, you know, uh, receiving their retirement benefits for another 30 years. And so I think if I was a 25 year old in a pension plan today, I would have some serious questions about how the pension plan is investing to ensure my retirement security in 40 or so years. And, and I think the kinds of risks that need to be managed over that kind of time frame are really systemic risks, right? They're related to sustainability, absolutely. They're related to ecosystem instability. They're related to inequality and political instability. And they're related to the global climate breakdown. And most approaches to investment management treat these kinds of risks like an externality, right? They're exogenous. So they, you know, mainstream or traditional investment management don't really address these risks in a very effective way. Uh, and they don't show up in a real way investment decision making. So I think, you know, uh, those are the questions that, that I think I would be raising if I was a young person and, and the degree to which there is intergenerational equity uh, in terms of pension funds ability to fulfill that fiduciary duty, not only to uh, those folks who are retiring now or in 10 years, but, you know, for, for the young beneficiaries who are looking forward to what, what is our system and economy and my world going to look like in 30 years. I mean, I'll just add one, one thing to that, which I think some people uh, may not fully realize, especially in Canada, is just how influential and big our pension system is and the influence they can have in the world, right? And so when, we, when you look at all the largest public companies, significant shareholders are Canadian pension funds. When you look at industries like the private equity industry, some of the biggest funders to that are, are our pension funds, right? And so there is certainly uh, some obligation to think about what is the impact we are having, what is our capital having on the world more broadly, but also it's an opportunity to affect change. If we can do it in a smart and an intelligent way that doesn't, like where is, there's a big uh, gap between, you know, saying I need to lose money to do good in the world versus I need to make 20% on a private equity investment that might cost hundreds and thousands of jobs, right? And so there's a lot of room for pension funds to operate in an interesting and exciting way to, to use that influence if, if we're actively thinking about it. Yeah, I grew up in Toronto and uh, uh, it always boggles my mind how much of downtown Toronto is owned by the people who used to teach me public school. Uh, the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund is just such a gigantic investor in Toronto real estate. It's often uh, uh, mind blowing that that is such a large investor. Um, but it brings up one of those, you know, really, really interesting kind of questions or, or puzzles that we have is that we all wear a lot of different hats um, when we talk about economic activity. Like I am 
I'm a worker, but I'm also a consumer and I'm also an investor and a voter and an entrepreneur. And, you know, those, if I, if I only look at the world through one of those lenses, um, often maximizing that approach involves trade-offs that might hurt the other parts of my life as well. Um, I wonder if anyone wanted to, to speak to those kind of bifurcated or trifurcated or, or however many divisions we have, um, interests that we, we face um, in trying to create a more sustainable economy. Maybe I'll, I'll just take a, a crack at that. I mean, I, um, under the name, uh, under the ideology of shareholder value maximization, right, we've seen these very extractive practices that are detrimental to workers and essentially deny the workers' contribution to value creation in a nutshell. Uh, what's fascinating is that that can ultimately be driven by investment and investment structures and, and pension funds, which are ultimately also owned by workers, right? So, but because of the complex layers and the disintermediation of capital, we wear these different hats, but we're, we're not necessarily connected <laughs> to these different um, roles that we play in the economy. Um, so that would be one, one point. Um, the, we've touched on, on corporate governance, right? Um, and systemic risk and how to loop inequality into systemic risk. Um, and that is perhaps one of the ways that we can reconnect those dots and have a more uh, holistic picture um, of, the, of the economy. Yeah, there's a, um, it's interesting that that, you know, you know, that answer ties into uh, a couple of the questions that we've actually been getting um, through Zoom. Um, received two so far, which both actually are, are asking about this issue between um, small businesses versus the, the big monopoly platforms uh, in the recovery. Um, uh, because you know, certainly you know, the, the corner store has far fewer degrees of, of that uh, disintermediate or intermediation mm. um, than, um, than we would imagine Uber would. Um, uh, uh, so this, this is a core question, which is, you know, how do we see, or how could we see, um, small companies and, and smaller economies, you know, not just big cities, but rural areas, northern communities, um, be able to survive or at least not get completely left behind, um, during this, this period of crisis and recovery. Uh, I, know, I don't know if Taylor, you wanted to take a crack at that since you, you were talking a bit about the small business sector and, and how this has hit them. Sure, sure. And, and like this is a really tough one. And I think one of the things we have to realize about um, how some of the platform monopolies that uh, Raphael mentioned have been built is in a lot of cases, they use capital as like an, a tool of aggression in some ways, right? So if you look at you know certain delivery companies to be unnamed, they will raise hundreds of millions, if not, you know, I think over a billion dollars now in a lot of cases where they then go and they pay customers to use their platform, right? No one can compete against a company that's paying their customers to use the platform, right? And so what you then see as a result is COVID hits, all those competitors have been washed out, and now there's major premiums that are getting pushed through to consumers that aren't going to workers, that aren't going to restaurants. And so what they're, you know, when we look at things like that, there is a big role government has to play in actually enforcing things like antitrust. Like antitrust is something that's broken down over the last hundred years, really, in a uh, you know, very material way, where now we only think about it as, uh, you know, if they're charging customers high prices, that's when you're in violation, when in fact, it's much deeper than that if you go back into the history of how it works. And so there's certainly a role that um, government needs to play in leveling the playing field and making sure we have a competitive open market, which frankly we don't have. And, that, and that's a core principle to what capitalism is supposed to be. We don't in a lot of cases have a competitive and open market today. Now the other thing is that on the flip side of this, you know, getting access to scale economics and efficiency has never been easier. If you're a small business, there are, there's tons of technology out there to give you the ability to, com to compete. It's a challenge though to adapt to that. So how do you start to get access to say purchasing groups that might be spread out across the country? How do you get access to more shared services for things like digital marketing or otherwise? 
it's tough. And for a business that's just trying to survive day to day, you know, you, you don't necessarily have the time and resources to do that. But you, you know, more people, more organizations, like what's what we're trying to do is to step up to provide support where we can so that businesses can get access to the tools that are already out there to compete. Right. So it's in, in, in our view, really, it's a combination of of making sure, you know, we have the right public policy to support these things while also, you know, getting small businesses access to things that are out there that are hard for them to adapt to right now. And, and this may provide us with a window to do so. You already seen the city of Toronto has some new programs associated with helping um, companies shift online, helping small businesses shift online. So that, that there's a, you know, something to be excited about in some ways there. Thanks, Taylor. Um, the, it's, it's, it's interesting trying to even play out what this is going to look like from that public policy side moving forward. Um, the priority number one, job number one right now is still very much maintaining or, or at least trying to get a hold on the health impacts of the bike of the virus. But as we move towards, you know, varying degrees of reopening the economy or trying to stimulate it even more, um, you know, that, that, uh, I like that, that term capital is a tool of aggression um capital is going to be available at a lower cost than probably it has in uh my entire lifetime to many large players which is shocking because interest rates were already about as low as we thought they could go um in large parts of the world um so you know, what is that going to look like what what does that mean for the entrenchment or and who actually gets access to zero percent uh loans and who doesn't will will be really impactful um so um we had another question coming i think which is a which is an interesting one that that seems like a natural to to gear probably towards shannon to start which is this question of um the reliance of of pension funds on having to or trying to achieve at least uh, market returns. Um, does that expectation, um, sort of all the stakeholders involved in a pension fund, uh, limit the ability of those who are managing or putting pressure on their pension funds to actually address issues like a sustainable environment and reducing inequality? Would we, do, do we have to look at pension funds differently? Well, I think, uh, you know, I mean, pension funds have an obligation to meet their liabilities. They need to, to meet the pension promise, as it's often said. They need to be able to pay those pensions, which requires returns, right? And it requires a process of, of matching their assets with those liabilities. But I don't think that that process is so much of an either or process. And I look at um, organizations, for example, like the Cassidy Pope in Quebec and its establishment of $4 billion fund to support Quebec businesses. That how, you know, the Cassidy Pope considers itself an anchor institution in the Quebec economy. Uh, we look also at the Fonds de Solidarité, which is another uh, uh, pension fund in Quebec. It's a, a very unique fund. Uh, and the uniqueness of that fund also, it's very connected. The, the purpose of that fund is not only to deliver the pension promise and to deliver returns to its beneficiaries, but also to support economic development, business development in Quebec. And so when you see that we put into the DNA of these funds, not only to deliver the financial returns, but to support the place that they're in, the economy that they live in, I think that can drive some significant change. We look at the, the decision by the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund to take out uh, you know, more than they've ever taken out before in order to help you know, build a bridge into, from the current crisis into the next economy. I'm, I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing the Ontario teachers do that or, 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 or and not to pick on them, but I'm not seeing other uh, you know, big, funds that could operate more like an anchor institution and help build up our economies. And I don't think that has to happen with the sacrifice of returns. I think it needs to happen with some creativity, some different people around the table with some different skills uh, and, uh, and some courage. Uh, and you know, uh, back again, one of the limitations to that is this very strict and narrow interpretation of fiduciary duty. So we need regulators to help give us some guidance on that desperately. <laughs> 
So I might just add in here for a second. So just as a background, I prior to being social capital partners, I worked in private equity for one of the pension funds and sort of in, inside view and how these investment teams work. And there's certainly a lot of pressure and both from a fiduciary perspective, but also in the way incentives are designed to make sure you're getting market rate returns. Now, um, what I would say is that, you know, there are opportunities to, you know, use in different, different investment models to drive better outcomes. So that's what our core focus is around employee ownership right now is we've got a model that we can use in the U.S. that we think is, you know, very investable. We, we know we're already talking to pension funds. It is very investable from, from their perspective. And it's a different model that drives much better outcomes uh, where they can invest directly on a long-term basis. So we need more creative ways for our institutional investors to invest and get fair returns, not make a sacrifice while also driving better outcomes. Now, one of the big areas they frankly had an opportunity to do so is doing more on a direct basis. So more and more, especially Canadian pension funds are investing directly. You know, if, if they're not, if they're going through funds, there's massive, massive amounts of fees that get charged by others in the industry, these other intermediaries. And so if you can start to address those fees that are getting charged there, there's a, we're talking about a lot of money to work with, right? And so, you know, there's the whole industry change that pension funds can be at the forefront of doing that doesn't result in them losing returns that actually can create much better outcomes for many more people, right? And so I, I do think it's not an either or, as Shannon mentions, like there are lots of opportunities for pension funds to use their capital in a, in a way that drives better outcomes and builds a, a more a stronger, more resilient economy. And if I can, if I can mention, that's that's exactly what we're working on at the pre-distribution initiative. We're we're trying to really call out these huge extraction points in the economy, and it's Shannon mentioned executive compensation, and that's one. But another one is the compensation of private equity managers, right? Um, uh, so think about the holistic picture higher up the chain. The rethink the investment structures into companies. Um, in a way that's not going to exacerbate inequality, but reduce it. So that's a rethinking that needs to happen. Um, and um, there's also, you know, economists also need to play a role in the story because they, there's not a real theory of value and who creates value and who get, gets, should get rewarded for it. Uh, what you have in economics is a wishy, wishy washy explanation that isn't an explanation at all, but more of an after the fact justification. Um, and so we need economists to, to, to be looped in and really call out all of these areas of, of rent extraction. It's, it's a, that's an interesting point to, to kind of bring us to a close on because you know, we've, we've been talking about uh, through, through much of this time here, a lot of these very abstract levels of the economy uh, and talking about the way financial financialization is hit and, and dollars move around and what governance looks like. But you know, if, if COVID has revealed anything, it's the practical, actual, tangible nature of what things look like. That a supply chain isn't just abstract numbers on a spreadsheet. It is whether or not face masks get to an ER doc. Um, it is whether or not someone is able to keep their restaurant up and running. It's whether or not you're able to get a safe delivery to your house of the meal that you need to eat. Um, and trying to pay attention to those actual tangible places where value is created uh, in our economy, I think has been a theme that, that has actually uh, gone through a lot of the conversation we've had today. So I hope that theme, amongst others, will continue uh, with everyone who's been on the call uh, going forward and as you go out into your coffee breaks. So thank you very much for uh, joining us, Shannon, Taylor, and Raphael. Thank you for the organizers. And I hope those of you who've been in this panel with us uh, will have some good conversations coming from it. Thanks for moderating, Sean. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you so much. Sean. Thank you, everyone. I know. I'm available to stay if people have other questions. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not, but uh, okay. So Isaac said we can continue with the Q&A. Um, so unfortunately, I do have to depart right now. So uh, thank you. Good chatting, uh, Raphael and Shannon. And I hope you all have a good uh, afternoon. Uh, I'm going to, I think it, this one's for you, uh, Shannon. Sure. Um, question? From Jenna, does the reliance of pension funds on market returns limit their power to make change on issues like income inequality? If so, does that suggest that pension funds, pension funds will have a different funding mix? Yeah, I think, I mean, the point that I would make there is that um, 
one of the most powerful um, tools of pension funds are actually their voices, right? Uh, and their ability to uh, use their power, not only to influence corporate policy, but also to participate in public discussions, to, to put out expectations with regards to wages and uh, inequality, climate change and that sort of thing. So um, rather than sort of continue to play with the asset mix, I'd be really interested in pension funds participating more in broader dialogues, not only with regulators and companies, but actually thinking about the ecosystem, the kind of resilience we need requires lots of people at the table. Pension funds, you know, to date, I think, haven't showed up at that table necessarily. Mm -hmm. And do you think, Shannon, if there was a way to in better incorporate issues like climate change or inequality into the ESG framework mm -hmm. from a reporting point of view, could we change the, even the way that returns are being assessed yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, there is, uh, the problem of the benchmark, right? Um, that's right. In, and absolutely, what are we measuring success against? Um, and there's lots of challenges with, um, you know, using the benchmark exclusively. Um, uh, and again, I mean, I think that, you know, there's only so much you can do in terms of asset selection and, and, and shifting things around in that sense. But um, in terms of climate change, I think we need to be looking at real policy shifts and, you know, and, and making sure pension funds are participating actively in the kinds of incentives we need to be moving much quicker uh, in the direction towards a low income, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. low carbon economy. Maybe a related question uh, from Chloe. How would big investors choose where to invest during this pandemic, especially where monopoly is a big concern? and the smaller businesses are being left behind. For shareholders being part of it, do they often get to choose their investments? Yeah, so I think, I mean, that was the point I, I was making in terms of the decision of the Cassidy Poe, right? I think that we're seeing some interesting bond products come out, which are sort of recovery bonds. I mean, and that's happening everywhere from sort of Van City, um, uh, and Van City Community Investment Bank, for example, which would be, you know, available to smaller, uh, investors, but you know the decision by the custody po is another decision of of allocating capital during this crisis, um, and, and one where they see you know the long term success and viability of custody po is embedded in the long term success of the Quebec economy, right? And so there's not this decoupling that I think we see from other large funds from sort of the real economy. Mm. There was another question on, on uh, green jobs. Uh, how is work going to change in the climate change era where we will be increasingly pressured to solve its causes and consequences and make money at the same time? Any thoughts on green jobs and green new deal discourses, um, the rise of social entrepreneurship in Canada and what's the way forward? Uh, I mean, there's an issue of adapting to a world of slow growth right um this idea that we can just maintain these high high growth rates in the economy and ignore uh environmental constraints is not sustainable um how to actually transition to this slow growth or no growth world but still have uh reduced inequality and an increase in quality of living and an increase in uh, quality jobs. Um, I think we need a very strong political response, which has been sort of lacking. Uh, in terms of the Green New Deal discourse, it's very interesting. It's unfortunately reliant, reliant on having a currency, which is the world reserve currency, right? So the, the, real, the only way that you can really print trillions of dollars and get away with it is because of the status of the dollar as a reserve currency. Now, I don't know how that works for, for Canada, you know, but that would be one of my critique is, uh, how do other countries do this <laughs> uh, when they don't have the ability you know, to do that? But right now we're seeing the, the Fed printing trillions of dollars, but they're doing it to buy corporate bonds of mm -hmm. companies you know, that, have, that are over leveraged. So we could have used that power of monetary policy in a different way, but we don't. The, the political uh, motivation seems to be lacking. Um, in terms of green jobs, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, 
Yeah, yeah I think, yeah. I mean, so I, just to give an example, Cher has done some work uh, in the transition from coal to, to um, cleaner energy. And the work that we've done there is to convince the companies that in that transition, we want to see a plan for the workers. So we want to see those workers um, you know, re in, in student, uh, retrained and able to carry on being employed, but also with the same wages, with the same protections, with the same health and safety, because that is that shift could be an opportunity to once again sort of um, put a downward pressure on on labor. And so we're talking to the companies to get those kinds of commitments. And again, sometimes that's working jointly with trade unions, working jointly with the governments to ensure that that transition is not leaving the workers behind. Um, you know, the more that um, we're up against these challenges, the more that it's becoming very clear that we need lots of different people at the table. And if we're looking at a uh, a new Green Deal context in Canada, we need to be talking with the Bank of Canada, we need to be talking with the Infrastructure Bank of Canada and get everybody on the same page of what this direction looks like and that we do have some sort of long-term vision for this country of how we're going to transition uh, and how we're going to, to um, be viable, resilient and successful uh, within the context of, of climate change and our need to, to move to a, a low carbon economy. There's Great. Question. I don't. I don't see any other question. I'm yeah, sorry. I'll just. Kate Potter asked about how can small rural economies compete, and um, I've been uh, really inspired by the work of the Democracy Collaborative, and I'd suggest that you you take a look at some of the work that they're doing. Um, there's the Cleveland model and uh, the Preston model, and and the way that they've been working with sort of Rust Belt areas or um, areas that uh, uh, are deindustrializing. Um, and I think that the lessons that they're learning there in terms of building a, a more local circular economy are very relevant to, to the rural economy context. Okay, well, um, I think we have just a couple of minutes before they're going to shut us out. So there's an opportunity to join a coffee chat if people are interested. Rafael, it's been a huge pleasure um, getting to know you better and your work. Um, so thanks. Uh, it was fun. Likewise. Yeah, <laughs> this was this one by too quickly. I know. <laughs> uh, all right. Take care. Ciao. Ciao.